Hi class. Okay, we're doing now a video lecture on um, this theme and mode. So the theme is divine versus human love in ancient texts, and we'll also be talking about lyric poetry. So I'm comparing lyric poetry uh, that was produced by China, the Near East, and Greece in this talk. Here are the goals. So we'll first introduce what this mode of poetry is. It's a particular genre, and it has a particular way of um, organizing itself. Uh, so we'll define lyric poetry, we'll talk about the cultures that produced it, I'll give you tips on how to analyze it, um, and then also we'll kind of ask this question towards the end of today, what can the lyric mode tell us that, epic, that the epic mode cannot? Um, we've been reading a lot of epics lately, so I'm going to kind of compare this version of poetics to, to the epic poetics. And then our content today to kind of organize everything is thinking about um, human love as distinct from divine love and how these ancient cultures differentiated these types of love. So um, a kind of related thing that you will see <laughs> very soon is um, we'll be talking a lot about sexuality because it's something that distinguishes the humans from the divine for the most part. Okay, so here's some background on lyric poetry. Um, lyric is uh, a formal type of poetry, what, what, what I mean by that is um, it, it has a particular form to it. Uh, the lines don't continue and wrap around the page. You, you have like, you know, four stanzas or something like that, or in um, Chinese lyric poetry, sometimes it's, it's like four characters and then another group of four characters. So there's, it, there's a very regular form that the poems take. So visually on the page, you can, um, they have a particular way of, of appearing. And you'll see this as I put examples in the, these slides. So, uh, prose, prose is just kind of like how novels are, where like the paragraph wraps around and the whole page is filled with text. So prose is um, distinct from poetry. Prose can be lyrical. Um, it can have like a kind of rhythm to it, but it's it doesn't have the same form as lyric poetry. If this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it, it's fine. <laughs> um, lyric poetry typically expresses emotion in a uh, expression emotion more efficiently or effectively than than epic does uh, and it expresses emotion typically through using the first person pronoun usually for the speaker so in especially the western tradition the i so like if someone's speaking and using i they they mean themselves so these are sort of poems that are express uh, personal feelings of the speaker um as we read these poems the i in the poem uh, usually aligns the speaker with the reader as well. So they might arouse emotions in, in you as you read these poems. Lyric poetry is very, very popular even now. We, I mean, everyone's still kind of, I mean, maybe, maybe you don't, but <laughs> for the most part, usually people really like lyric poetry. Songs are lyric poetry. You know, you might look up song lyrics, for example. Um, that's, that's kind of what we mean. So songs have um, a particular form to them. There's usually verses and a chorus. Um, maybe a bridge. Uh, so anyway, that's songs today are kind of they derive from this tradition of, of poetry. Um, and in fact, in the past, uh, often these these poems were sung. So um, there might have been a musical component back then as well as today. Uh, the term lyric, so the quotes around it, uh, it derives from the Greek version of lyric poetry, which was accompanied by a lyre. So that's where we get the word lyric. A lyre is like a little, um, it's kind of like a guitar or a harp. Um, we use this term in English from the Greek, but you should know that many cultures have lyric poetry. We just use the Greek word. Okay, how to analyze it. So first, my suggestions are um, focus on the narrator or the speaker. How is the eye constructed through the language employed? And so what I, what I mean by that is what can you figure out about the speaker through how the speaker kind of speaks? <laughs> like, what do you learn about them? Can you kind of picture who they are, like if they have a gender or if they have particular characteristics. Sometimes you can figure your things out about them based on what they're talking about. Um, you might also focus on the audience. Usually these poems are dedicated to somebody. Um, sometimes there is a you. Um, or sometimes the poem is just sort of about a feeling or something like that. Um, so maybe the, maybe the audience of the poem is just us as readers. So to whom is the speaker speaking? What is the relationship between the audience and the speaker? So this kind of relationship usually can be gleaned um, through the language of the poem. So we'll, we'll be doing this 
you know, we'll be providing an example soon. Um, so yeah, think about the relationship between speaker, audience, and content. You know, what is the speaker inviting us to think about? Is there something that that speaker is leaving out or manipulating even? Um, is there room for the audience to speak back to the speaker or not? You know, usually not, but sometimes there might be some room. And um, the content can sometimes uh, convey really important things about how the speaker and their audience is relating to one another. Uh, so from this, we could kind of derive values and expectations or norms even um, through the poetry. So um, if you're interested in like gender, class, race, these issues can sometimes be gleaned through these poems uh, in a way. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, just this is a slide that I used in my the first lecture that was optional, but I'll, I'll repeat it here. But this is just to kind of um, demonstrate that around the same 700 year period, there were simultaneous achievements in literacy and culture among uh, ancient China, the ancient Near East through the, the Hebrew group, and um, ancient Greece. So um, in China, all of these very foundational documents, um, texts, were, were produced and kind of perfected. So the Book of Documents, the Book of Changes, and the Book of Odes. We'll be focusing on the Book of Odes today, the um, the poems, the book of poetry, the Shi Jing, I believe. Um, in, in terms of uh, Hebrews, the ancient Hebrews, uh, they produced and perfected the Talmud, which are the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Um, you know, Genesis, uh, what is the second one? Leviticus, I think. Exodus, well, yeah, whatever. Anyway, the first five. Um, they also produced uh, these very important books of the Bible, too. If you um, were raised in this, this tradition or in, in Christianity, maybe you know some of these. This is Psalms tend to be important. Um, okay, and then also uh, Homer, Homeric and Hesiodic poetry. So you read a little of both now. They were produced at the same time, too. So all across the world, very far from each other in very different cultures, but they were all producing kind of these classics at the same time. Okay, so let's talk about lyric poetry in China. So this is the, the region of China that um, became developed more readily at the time. So um, primarily, if we're talking about the Book of Odes, we're, we're discussing the, the Zhou dynasty. That's, um, anyway, uh, this is uh, from uh, the emperor of the Wei dynasty, so a, a later dynasty, but looking back on uh, former dynasties. But this, this uh, emperor, uh, Cao Pai, I think you might spell that with a C as well in Pinyin. But anyway, he's the first emperor of the Wei Dynasty, 300 AD. So um, he says that literary works offer the greatest legacy in governing the kingdom. So this gives us a lot of information about how much poetry is revered in ancient China. It was kind of viewed as a way of um, organizing society and legitimizing the governing body. Um, and we'll, we'll see that as we turn to the, the Book of Odes. Um, yeah, so like if you have uh, people who are all reading the same literature, it kind of makes them <laughs> uh, unified in a way that, that's very unique. Um, it's something unique to, uh, to China specifically because China is such a vast area and it encompasses many, many different ethnic groups, many different languages and um, practices. But um, one thing that unites China and united China, even in the ancient world, was this reverence of these foundational texts like the Book of Odes. So um, anyway, it's very exciting. So the Book of Odes, uh, they were written originally during the, the Zhou Dynasty and sort of in celebration of the Zhou Dynasty. This was the first dynasty that was very peaceful um, in China. And so, uh, you know, this is the time range. Okay, uh, what's interesting about the Book of Odes especially is that... Um, Chinese tradition, it begins with lyric poetry and not epic. A lot of our other cultures we're studying this semester really begin with epic, like thinking of the Epic of Gilgamesh, thinking of the Iliad. We'll read the Ramayana, that's sort of the um, ancient Hindu traditions, that's an epic as well. But China's very different. They didn't begin with epic, this kind of like rousing national um, story about a man. No, no, no. They began with lyric poetry, which is much more um, emotional, sensitive, and um, expansive, really. Uh, so the Book of Odes, or also called the Classic of Poetry, it consists of 305 songs or poems. 
Uh, the earliest are from around 1000 BC, the latest from around 600 BC. Uh, the manuscripts circulated amongst the Zhou aristocracy, so this is the ruling body of the dynasty. And so they were like collecting these poems and reading them together and like sending them to their friends and stuff like that. Uh, the poems represent many levels of, soci of society. So um, each of the 305 songs is written in, in a different voice, a different lyricist. Um, and so it's, you know, some are women, some are men, some are high class people, some are low class people. Um, I mean, low class by <laughs> like as in as in like peasant or something rather than like low class, like they're bad or something. Anyway, so many levels of society. Uh, the topics are very varied as well. So there might be like a poem about the history of the dynasty, um, a king lamenting something, soldiers glorifying war, soldiers deploring war. There's love songs, there's marriage songs, there's hunting songs, banquet songs, mourning songs. There's all sorts of stuff. So it's just like it's meant to be kind of representative of the entire sort of region that the Zhou dynasty ruled over. Um, it's the, it was also treated as the basic educational document for the Zhou aristocracy. So this was, you know, through its circulation, um, this group of people sort of, you know, educated themselves and reminded themselves what they should be striving for and working for. And um, so this is kind of, you know, it's pretty, I mean, it's, it's exciting to my mind. Um, these poems from different levels of society, you know, are being circulated and celebrated by the people in charge. So that kind of just tells you that, like, they found it very important to celebrate even the lower classes of people. Um, the Zhou dynasty especially, they believed that governance um, was legitimated from the people. So, like, if the common people did not agree with how the things were going, then um, it, then that meant that the gover government was not legitimate and it could be overthrown. So um, this is kind of one way of uh, the governing body to kind of, um, you know, just to sort of honor the people that they're actually, um, the people who give them their power, that is, the common people. Uh, so anyway, um, it's the basic educational document, document for the... Zhou aristocracy, and it became the core of Zhou heritage even as independent states emerged in China. So even after the Zhou dynasty fell, um, this document survived, and uh, people continued to read it and celebrate it. Um, Confucius becomes kind of a part of this tradition too. It's the sort of legend is that he might have been the editor of these poems. So if you know Confucius, he's this very sage and very well respected, and super important figure in ancient China. Um, he established, among other things, kind of like um, an educational system uh, for uh, Chinese young men. Uh, so anyway, these are his thoughts on poetry, uh, specifically the, the, book, the Book of Odes. Um, so that's what he's referring to here. By the poems, you can stir people and you can observe things through them. You can express your resentment in them and you can show sociable feelings. Close to home, you can use them to serve your father and on a larger scale, you can use them to serve your ruler. Moreover, you can learn to recognize many names of birds, plants, and trees. So these, he's just showing how educational they are. Like, um, you know, you learn about the world around you, but if you learn these poems and memorize them, you can serve your father through them or your ruler through them. You know, you, you're a good citizen by learning these. Um, this is interesting, too. You can express your resentment in them. So because it was a document that everyone kind of knew and had memorized, Sometimes you could, you know, refer to lines from the poems in certain contexts, you know, to be a little bit ironic, but um, you sort of protect your own um, ideas by filtering your ideas through this poetry that everyone else knows, too. So it's kind of a, an interesting, like, it's like a common language, in, in a sense. Um, okay. So, again, these poems capture the voices of all people in the society. Uh, it legitimizes many distinct voices. So you might compare this to the univocality, the, the one voice of Homer and Hesiod's epics. There's usually, excuse me, only uh, one speaker, and it's, it's usually taken to be Hesiod or Homer. These have many voices. Um, there's poems of celebration, there's poems of protest altogether. Um, so the poems might be even contradictory. Usually Homer and Hesiod, those are pretty, they're not, I mean, they might deal with contradictions, but they want to promote at least they want to promote one worldview. But these are like all over the place, really. Um, Confucian moralists stress that the poems came naturally and spontaneously from human feeling. So the idea is the speaker is being truthful and authentic in this tradition. 
Um, you might compare Hesiod's poems when he's ventriloquizing the muses. The muses say, we know how to say many false things that seem like true sayings. So maybe in the West, there's more evidence to say that um, poems might be lying to you. Not, not so here. These poems are natural, you know, true feelings. They might be confused, but they're not lying to you. They're not trying to trick you or something. Um, also, I've already sort of said this, but these, uh, this po book of poems promotes anti-heroic values. Not to say that there aren't heroes in them, but um, instead of like the domination and control that we see in a lot of Western works, you know, think ancient, think uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, think the Iliad. Um, the values here are order and balance. So if we have a, a, someone who's trying to control things, usually the poem kind of corrects that behavior towards towards balance so that um, harmony is achieved as opposed to like one person controlling everything. Okay, let's look at some poems. So I, my Chinese is too bad to try this at all. It's also, um, this is like uh, traditional Chinese characters, I believe. So you, this might be kind of... Um, new to you too, if you know um, Mandarin or no, no characters here, uh, Mandarin or Cantonese, I guess. Um, but uh, so I'll be reading the, the English translation we have. Just so you know, I've been made aware by former students that um, some of these characters might be wrong, some of the translations might be not great. The, the dude who did the translations here is a poet, so he's trying to capture the feelings of the original, but he might not be completely accurate in terms of literal translation. So anyway, feel free to like, you know, think whatever you like of this. Um, these, uh, the Hansa here, I got from this uh, University of Virginia site, so they might have partic they might have some mistakes in there as well, but here we are. Okay, so I'll, I'll read the, um, the English translation aloud. So, um, Fishhawk. The fishhawks sing guan guan on sandbars of the stream. Gentle maiden, pure and fair, fit pair for a prince. Watercress grows here and there, right and left we gather it. Gentle maiden, pure and fair, wanted, waking, and sleeping. Wanting, sought her, had her not. Waking, sleeping, thought of her. On and on he thought of her. He tossed from one side to another. Watercress grows here and there, right and left we pull it. Gentle maiden, pure and fair, with harps we bring her company. Watercress grows here and there, right and left we pick it out. Gentle maiden, pure and fair, with bells and drums do her delight. Okay, so let's return to the tips of lyric poetry reading. Um, I invited you to think about the speaker. Um, where is the I? Where is first person pronouns kind of happening here? Um, I don't think I know necessarily here, if I can even see them. We do see kind of like uh, people populated. So like um, first it's a fish hawk, then there's a maiden, there's watercress, gentle maiden, wanting so wanting sought her, had her not, waking, sleeping, he thought of her, on and on he thought of her. Finally we get a, a subject at least, it's a he. So he is the guy doing all the wanting and seeking and not having her and waking and sleeping and thinking of her. This is still not an I yet, this isn't the speaker. And the speaker's really withheld until um, here. Watercress grows here and there, right and left, we pull it. Um, so this is interesting, you know, so our speaker is a plural, um, first person plural here. So the people speaking are the, the people who are pulling watercress out of this stream, listening to the fish hawks, seeing a gentle maiden and a young man who wants her, but um, does not, it seems like he, he's not approaching her because he's tossing and turning at night with th the thought of her, but he's not actually approaching her. Um, and here again, the we, we pick it out. So these, the people who are speaking are the ones who are uh, picking the watercress. Interesting. <laughs> um, who is the audience of this poem? You know, we don't really see a you here, but we, as the readers, are probably the audience. Um, I am no expert on this tradition, of course, but like what the feelings that I get here are um, the, th the things I notice are um, first how how gentle and harmonious this scene it is. Um, it seems like things have been happening in this way at this site for a long time. Um, watercress grows here and there. Watercress grows here and there. Watercress grows here and there. All this repetition of this line. Uh, kind of implies to me that like these people's days are probably very similar. They 
go down to the stream and pick the watercress. Right and left we gather it, right and left we pull it, right and left we pick it out. Um, so it's kind of a sense of um, maybe monotony, I guess, in their lives, but also perhaps like um, just, you know, order, you know, they know what their lives are going to be like every day. And then entering this scene of like kind of a tranquility, we have a fish hawk who, fish hawks who are singing, which is nice. And then we have this, um, these subjects, which is the gentle maiden and the, the young man, the he who is thinking of her. Um, yeah, so you might have thoughts about like, <laughs> what's going on with this. Um, I, just because I've taught this with other students before, um, they brought up to me that, uh, you know, there's a certain kind of like music going on, which is interesting. And it's like the gentle maiden seems to like music. Gentle maiden with harps, we bring her company. The fish hawks are singing. The gentle maiden likes bells and drums. So wh whoever it is, it's the poem or maybe it's the young man. Maybe he's thinking about like wooing her or trying to get her to date him or something. But note also that he's like very hesitant. He wants her, he seeks her, but he doesn't get her. He is waking, he's sleeping, he's thinking of her. He's tossing from one side to another. This guy can't sleep. Um, in a way, uh, it's sort of, at least in ancient China, at least, it's not like, um, uh, it's not a good thing to go introduce yourself to somebody that you don't know. Um, if your parents introduce you or if someone else introduces you, that's okay. But like, it would not be um, appropriate for him to try to go date her, like go talk to her or something like that, apparently. This is what I've learned. So um, yeah, so anyway, we have this kind of scene of beauty and harmony, but also some longing from the young man who wants this, this girl that he, for some reason, is barred from, from uh, you know, contacting himself. But through music, maybe we can bring her company and we can give her delight. Okay, so nice. There, you know, feel free to bring up more. You know, maybe during an asynchronous, uh, during a synchronous class, or during um, our discussion, if you want to say more about this poem or others. Um, here's another one. Uh, so I, I picked the poems that are. There's a lot of poems about love, but I picked. I focused on ones that were about love. So that one is like the this young man who loves, or he seems to love, or at least you know he's interested in this young woman. Um, this one, I'll read it, and then you kind of picture who you think the speaker is. Okay, dead roe deer. A uh, roe deer dead in the meadow, all wrapped in white rushes. The maiden's heart was filled with spring. A gentleman led her astray. Undergrowth and forest, dead deer in the meadow, all wound with white rushes, a maiden white as marble. Softly now and gently, gently, do not touch my apron, sir, and don't set the cur to barking. Okay, interesting, interesting. So, um, speaker, speaker. The speaker, like in the last poem, the speaker only in, only unveils themselves in this last stanza here. Like it kind of waits a while. Um, you might ask yourself, who do you think is speaking here? Who is saying softly now and gently, gently, don't touch my apron, sir? So whoever's speaking is someone who has an apron, someone who's speaking to a man, sir. She doesn't really reveal herself. There's not really an eye, but like this is um, uh, vocalization where this these two stanzas were more like describing a scene about a dead roe deer who's in a in a forest. So I think the speaker is probably female. She's got an apron. Although it's interesting that it's not um, stated. Maybe there's a ta over here that is female, but I don't, I don't know. My Chinese isn't good enough to figure that out. But anyway, oh wait, is this wool? Yeah, wool. I think that's wool. Anyway, whatever. Okay, so whoever's speaking is probably female. Speaking to um, a sir. Uh, this is a for more formal, um, usually higher class, potentially, person. This poem is much less pleasant, I think, than the last one. And why? It's not a fish hawk singing, it's a, a deer that's dead <laughs> in the meadow, and it's wrapped in white rushes. And then we get this sort of, in this stanza here, the dead deer seems to be connected in some way to the maiden's heart which was filled with spring until this gentleman led her astray. So this is kind of contrast being um, described here. This sort of ideas of spring, meadows, forests, meadows, and then um, death and um, being led astray. Death and maybe marble. Marble is a stone that's 
uh, you know, shiny, but it's also kind of cold. Um, very different from something like a meadow that's filled with, with undergrowth and um, life and this sort of stuff. So what is this poem about? Okay, so we talked about the speaker, the audience. Um, so of course, we're the audience as the reader, but this third stanza is an address. The speaker says, softly now, gently, gently, do not touch my apron. This is a command of sorts. I don't know if this is true in the Chinese version, but this, in English at least, is a command. Like, do not touch my apron, sir. So somebody, some male figure is trying to touch her apron, and she says no. And she says, don't set the cur to barking. The cur is a dog. Um, so someone seems to be worried about what this guy is doing. He's trying to touch her. She doesn't want him to, or she wants him to be softer and more gentle. Um, don't make my dog bark. Maybe she doesn't want people to find out what's happening. But especially because this stanza comes after this other one where uh, a deer has been found dead, we get the feeling that um, this is not a very safe situation for the woman speaking. Um, whatever is going on with this guy, it seems like, or this sir, seems like he's trying to encroach on her. And she's worried because, you know, this deer, which is kind of like a metaphor for this maiden's heart, um, it, the deer is now dead. So the maiden, what happened to the maiden's heart? Well, a gentleman led her astray. I sort of get the feeling that this is probably um, a woman whose like, virtue has been taken by this gentleman. Um, so that's a very formal way of saying it. This is, this is probably a man who um, treated this woman badly, uh, perhaps. Perhaps he just took her virginity and shouldn't have or something, or maybe it's rape. I don't know. Something's bad. So something really is bad, and she's kind of worried about it. She's worried about other people finding out um, and uh, causing some sort of death to her or her virtue, maybe. Okay, nice. <laughs> Feel free to say more in um, the discussion post. Uh, this one I like a lot as well. Um, Mugua, Mugua. Anyway, um, translation is, is quince. Apparently this, this term also translates to papaya. It's some kind of fruit though. So this is what a quince looks like. A papaya is more like a tropical fruit. This is um, a like kind of a love poem that's a little bit more pleasant. So I'll read this one here. Okay, she cast a quince to me, a costly garnet I returned. It was no equal return, but by this love will last. She cast a peach to me, costly opal I returned. It was no equal return, but by this, love will last. She cast a plum to me, a costly ruby I returned. It was no equal return, but by this, love will last. So this is a lovely little poem. Um, of course, uh, here we do have a speaker more obvious, you know, in the first, let's see, the second line here, I guess. Um, I don't know my characters well enough. Anyway, so yeah, uh, the I seems to be, it's probably a man. I doubt that this is um, a woman just because heterosexuality is probably assumed in this culture. But there's a girl who is passing fruit to the speaker. And in return, the speaker, probably male, is giving the girl um, precious stones, a garnet, which I think is a red stone, um, opal, which is pretty um, iridescent kind of stone, and then a ruby, which is also red. I think it's garnet also. Anyway, whatever, red, red things. But very costly, so very expensive um, precious gems are being given to the girl, whereas the girl is giving him um, fruit. Uh, repeated all like, in every stanza, it was no equal return, but by this love will last. So what's kind of interesting in this poem is like, in some ways it is an equal return. Like she's giving him something, he's giving something in return. That's pretty equal. But in another way, it's not equal because of course gemstones are more expensive than fruit. It was no equal return. You know, if you're thinking like, from his perspective, maybe he's like, well, you know, I'm kind of giving her better presents <laughs> than she's giving me. Um, but he does conclude by this level last. So like, even though it's not equal, we will still maintain love. You know, we're both giving each other things. Um, uh, on the other hand, maybe it was no equal return because like, gemstones, I mean, they're lovely and everything, but you can't really, like, live by them. However, you can eat fruit and survive, you know? Like, so, like, these kind of, like, natural gifts might be more, like, life-sustaining than the, the gems, even though gems are more expensive and that kind of thing. 
And so like, even though there's kind of like inequality between the gifts, there is still inequal, there's still equality because the two are giving each other things back and forth. It's kind of nice. So this kind of, this poem celebrates the sort of harmony, even within difference that um, is really common in this tradition. So anyway, if you have more to say, please, please do. Um, yeah. Anyway, give gifts to people to make love last, apparently is this sort of one of the lessons, I guess. Okay. Now, I had you read um, this poem, Da Dong. It's um, the 203rd poem. This is a, quite a longer one, um, but it is also the source of this very um, famous and important folktale in the tradition. So uh, here are the lines that I want to focus on. That th These are the lines that speak to the um, folktale. So um, Da Dong is kind of, in, in a way, it's a, it's a poem about... Um, the Eastern people versus the Western people. The Western people um, have much more money, they're higher class. The Eastern people are more peasant class and um, they're suffering and working hard all the time. And so these lines here speak to that. Okay, so in the English translation, there is a Milky Way in heaven which looks down on us in light. And the three stars together are the weaving sisters passing in a day through seven stages of the sky. Although they go through their seven stages, they complete no bright work for us. Brilliant shine the drought oxen, but they do not serve to draw our carts. So this is, you might read this a couple times, you know, it's a little bit confusing, but what's, you know, there's contrasts being articulated here. So um, one of the contrasts is uh, the stars that are up in the Milky Way in heaven. And the, so the stars and being contrasted with looking down on us, the people who are on the earth, you know, so up in heaven, these stars, and then the people down on earth. Um, so that's one of the contrasts. Um, and uh, let's see here, another contrast is between the work that the stars do, um, the brilliant shine, the draught oxen, so the draught oxen, this is likely a star as well, so like, because it's shining, brilliant shine, the draught oxen, but they do not draw our carts. So there's the work that the heavens do, like the, the stars move around in the heavens and the sky. They're doing a kind of work, but they're not really doing the bright work for us down here on Earth. They do not serve to draw our carts. So, yeah, there's a contrast in kind of types of work, you know, like what the, the um, higher class people might, or maybe heavens might be doing versus what the lower class people or um, peasants might be doing. Um... All right. So anyway, this is <laughs> this is, seems kind of like um, not that important or something, but um, uh, but it is really important in terms of this folk tale. So th like all of these poems in this tradition, um, they seem very simple, but actually there's like so much complexity kind of embedded in them. Um, okay. So all this stuff, the Milky Way in heaven, the seven stages of the sky being passed in a single day, this these kind of all become part of the um, folk tale of the cowherd and the weaving girl. So it's this Chinese folktale. This is um, a uh, sort of an image depicting the myth uh, that's in the Summer Palace in Beijing. Um, here's the weaver girl. She's um, typically kind of treated as, or seen as like higher class. Um, the cowherd is kind of like a cowboy. So he's like, um, he herds cows. New Lang, New Lang is here and um, they have children together. But anyway, um, yeah, so this is the sort of, the sort of story. Um, in some versions of the story, both of them were stars. But then um, because of some like problem or, you know, sin or something like that, some kind of issue, uh, he gets um, moved to the earth um, and then they, they meet when she comes down to bathe and then they fall in love, get married, uh, have children, but then they're separated again because of their sort of difference in status. Her being this, she's the daughter of like a sky god or like a mother god, a sky mother god, or something like that. Anyway, there's different versions of this, so that's why I'm kind of being a little bit flip with it. You read the encyclopedia entry about this, um, there's different versions, but um, and he is like this kind of like, um, you know, he used to be a star as well, but then he's like embodied in an earthly form and raised by parents that don't really like him and they treat him badly, um, but he's got this really nice old cow who's really helpful <laughs> and um, sacrifices its um, its life so that he can meet his um, true love again. And um, because it is kind of like a cross-class match or a match um, between like 
the heavenly girl and the sort of earthly boy, um, they are separated. And so in one version, her mother is really mad that they meet up again and have kids. And so she separates them by the Milky Way. But every year on the Seven and Seven Festival, um, there's like a swallow, a bridge of swallows, these birds that forms, and the two can meet together again um, and see each other and be in love for that day. But then they have to separate again. So this is classic Chinese story where like um, the gods might throw impediments to humans, but the humans still have room to work hard and still um, achieve like a happy life. Even though it might not be perfectly happy, it's still happy. You know, it's kind of a happy ending. Um, okay, so it's, yeah. Some people say this is kind of like Romeo and Juliet, but um, not totally tragic because they get, to, they get to meet once a year. Okay, so subjectivity in the poem folk, folk tale. So um, what's, I really like this poem, uh, this um, folk tale. Um, but in terms of the, the poem, the Da Dong poem, and then also the folk tale too, uh, you might think about the humans that are involved. There's like common people being compared to wealthy sons, um, extrapolating outward. Maybe this poem is making a message about the Zhou dynasty. Those were, uh, they were located in the west of China versus the states of the east, which had less money and less funds. And so maybe it's, it's that kind of contrast. Um, there's also the contrast between the two stars, you know, New Lang, this is the, the cow herd. He seems to represent the common people or the East. Uh, Jin Yu, this is um, the girl. She seems to represent the Zhou, perhaps, uh, the wealthy people. But there's also these really great animals um, who have subjectivity, who, who act on behalf of the humans and seem to care about them. So the old cow, New Lang's um, old cow, who sacrifices his little cow self so that Yulong can meet his love again. And then the magpies who feel sorry for them. It's very sweet. <laughs> um, here's a question. Is this poem or is the folktale that the poem um, is the basis for? Is this an allegory? Um, an allegory is an extended story that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning. So some, most people can probably see the allegorical connections here in the story that like, you know, yes, it's a, it's a story that explains a natural phenomenon where stars are separated by the Milky Way. Do I have a picture of that for you? Yeah, here's a picture. Um, so like, here's the Milky Way or the Silver River, and here are the two stars. So they're separated by this river, um, but they're taken to be the lovers, you know, meeting once a year. Here they are, so cute. Um, anyway, so yeah, so it can, can it reveal a hidden meaning? Yeah, it seems to be something about like, um, you know, maybe it's not a good idea to defy parents um, and make your own love match. Like, you probably shouldn't marry someone just based on love. You should also marry someone based on your, you know, class level. Um, maybe it's an allegory about, like, why you need to do your duty. Like, she has this duty to weave, st uh, weave clouds and stuff in the heavens. And maybe when she falls in love, she's not doing her duty anymore. And so she gets punished or something. Um, so yeah, there's different ways to interpret it, maybe. Um, but yeah. There definitely does seem to be some sort of hidden meaning here. Like, um, I think I had a student tell me that his mother referred to this folktale as a reason why he should keep studying. Because it's like, don't think about girls right now. You just need to keep studying, you know. <laughs> keep studying and, and, you know, work hard. Um, and then eventually you'll be, you know, rewarded by, like, a love that, that will last or whatever. It's like, okay, sure. Okay, so anyway, lovely, lovely story. And um, this is still a festival in, in China, the Double Seventh Festival. So it's on the seventh lunar month on the seventh day. So it's usually, like, July 7th, I think. Um, they have this festival where they have, like, a little... It's kind of a little bit like Valentine's Day, but it's it's different as well, obviously. So, yeah, a little, kind of a love story festival. If you know the, there's a movie, no, what is it called? There's a Korean drama called um, Crash Landing on You. That's the English translation when it's on Netflix. And it, in a way, is kind of like a retelling of this folktale. In fact, there's, there's a lot of retellings of this folktale um, in, in modern uh, media, so... If you are interested in this, um, this would be a great thing to explore in assignment three. Okay, now we're gonna do like kind of an ab <laughs> abrupt change and think about um, ancient Greece. 
uh, Sappho. So what's interesting about this is um, why I put it next is because just like in this story where there's kind of like a love that is in some way forbidden, that actually is happening with Sappho as well. But it's not because of a class difference, but it's about like a gender difference. Um, Sappho is really important in the West because it, she's a female. So she's a woman poet. Um, this is what we know about her. So she was born 630 BC in Lesbos. Um, so, you know, maybe a little bit after Homer and Hesiod. Uh, Lesbos, you might know that term. This is the, it's an island. There is, you can go visit and everything, but this, this term is um, the sort of the root for the word lesbian. Um, Sappho is very associated with lesbian desire. So she's writing poems about, like from a female subject position and thinking about um, a beloved figure who is also female. Uh, she was very, very popular in, in her day, which is pretty great, you know, especially since it's like a female poet and everything. Little of her work, however, survives in full now. It might have been one of those things where like everyone loved it so much that they didn't copy it down enough. And so like some of the stuff has been lost. Um, this poem, I think, is in full, so we'll read this one together. She's among the first poets in the West to sustainably use the I in her lyric poetry. So, um, like I said before, like, the West has a lot more epic poetry, but in terms of lyric poetry, this sort of, like, emotional and, um, intimate kind of poetry, sh she's using the I. So it's, you know, feelings are important here in these poems. Uh, Sappho was also... Uh, she was a real person, you know, she was a wife and a mother. But even though she was a wife to a man, she writes of passionate, intimate connections between women. So it's kind of interesting, um, you know, was she like unhappily married, maybe? You know, others might say like, maybe it wasn't really a woman, maybe it was a man just impersonating a woman. So maybe that's true too. We don't, we can't ever really know who these people were, but um, at least the constructed I in her poetry seems to suggest that she's a woman who, um, who loved women. Okay, so um, let's read this here. This is kind of hard to understand. It usually takes a couple of readings to kind of get it, but um, this is another one of those poems where the first line becomes the title. Okay, like the very gods in my sight is he. So just pausing there. <laughs> it seems like this poem will be about a man who is like the very gods in this woman's sight. You might assume that that's, that means that she wants to date him or something, or she thinks he's amazing. Like, wow, you're so amazing. You're like the very gods in my sight. Yeah. But we learned that that's not really the case. Okay, so I'll, keep, I'll start reading it. I'll read the whole thing and then we'll talk about it. Okay, like the very gods in my sight is he who sits where he can look in your eyes who listens close to you to hear the soft voice, its sweetness, murmur, and love, and laughter all for him. But it breaks my spirit. Underneath my breast, all the heart is shaken. Let me only glance where you are. The voice dies. I can say nothing. But my lips are stricken to silence. Underneath my skin, the tenuous flame suffuses. Nothing shows in front of my eyes. My ears are all muted in thunder. And the sweat breaks running upon me, fever shakes my body, paler I turn than grass is. I can feel that I have been changed. I feel that death has come near me. Okay. So you might pause here and, and read it again if this, you know, is hard to understand what's going on, but I'll, I'll start talking through it. So she starts off with this kind of simile, like the very gods in my sight is he who sits where he can look in your eyes, who listens close to you to hear your voice, its sweetness, murmur, and love and laughter all for him. So what she's saying here is th you get a sense that, okay, so we'll talk about speaker, I guess. Um, my sight, my spirit, let me only glance, I can say nothing. So the eye, what we learn about the eye here is that she's someone who's looking at a guy and looking at a girl. But meanwhile, while there's this guy and girl that a scene is happening with, she is having her spirit broken. My spirit is broken. Underneath my breast, all the heart is shaken. Her heart is shaken. Her spirit is broken. She tries to glance where you are, the female, where you are, and her voice dies. I can say nothing. 
my lips are stricken to silence, etc. My ears are muted in thunder. So this poor person, like I, although I, I can feel that I have been changed. I feel that death has come near me. This person is like really going through it. They're having such an emotional response, you know, with her voice shaken and her voice dying. She can't hear because there's thunder in her ears. Have you ever felt that when you're so nervous that you almost become deaf? So like muted in thunder, like you're deafened by loudness. She starts sweating, fever, shakes her body, she turns pale. She feels like she's almost dying. So this is like someone who's so nervous and so unable to talk that she, um, she feels like she's gonna die. And it's all because she's witnessing a man and woman in front of her where like the guy <laughs> can sit and look next to her beloved girl and inter interact with her. So like, this is the basically the scene between the, the guy and girl. He seems like a god because he can sit there and look in your eyes and listen close to you and hear your soft voice, its sweetness and murmur and love and laughter all for him. So it seems to me she's very like jealous of the male. He seems like a god because he can sit next to you, the beloved female figure, and listen to you and um, engage with you and seem natural with you and laugh with you. But I can't do that because why? Well, <laughs> either she's too nervous to do it, she can't approach this girl because she's too nervous, this girl's too beautiful maybe, or too, um, I don't know, too much for her, she can't, can't quite t take it. Like if you've, if you've ever had a crush on someone, maybe you can relate to this. You can't really be near them because they make you so upset. Um, you can't be yourself around them. But there is also the potential, given that she is a poet of sort of lesbian desire, Maybe the reason why she can't talk to this girl is because there, the love that she has for her would be forbidden to express. Like, this is not an okay thing. Like, even though this poetry celebrates this kind of love, it's not really seen as, like, okay or socially legitimate to do this. Um, maybe it's okay for a man, maybe. You know, Iliad, in the Iliad, Achilles and Patroclus have a love that seems very intimate. Um... But men have a lot more leeway to do things in this society than women do. Um, so that might be what's going on here. And in fact, uh, these days, um, sort of L the LGBTQ community um, has really taken on Sappho as kind of the expressing feelings of being trapped in the gender that you were born into, um, which kind of prevents you from following your heart. So anyway, um, I hope you like this poem. Uh, I'm gonna move on <laughs> away from Sappho. Uh, okay. Oh, one, one, one more thing. One, sorry, sorry, sorry. I do find it very interesting that like the gods here are being invoked as, um, you know, like the, the guy who can sit and look in the beloved's eyes and laugh with her, he's like a god. So she's like, she's so jealous. Like, oh, it's almost like you're a divine if you can have if, if your love is legitimate, but hers is illegitimate in a way because of her, you know, kind of queer desire, and she can't quite, um, I mean, she can't be happy. But, okay, I'll leave you alone there. Okay, so now, um, the last kind of major thing I want to talk about, this is from the uh, region of the Near East, so this is from the tradition of uh, the Hebrew Bible. It's also very important in Christianity, which inherits the Hebrew tradition, but, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the book of the Bible called Song of Songs. It's also sometimes called Song of Solomon because there's a legend that Solomon the king wrote these to his beloved. Um, often it's also called the Canticles, which is like, um, it's, uh, it's a word that means uh, singing. So it's Song of Songs. You know, there's so much singing going on here. This is a poem. This is a lyric poem. And it's very intimate and very emotional. Um, and it's about love. So it's kind of interesting. Usually the Bible is treated as like um, not super interested in love, but this is a book that's like so erotic, so filled with ideas about love. Uh, so it consists of a lyric dialogue between husband, a husband figure and a wife figure. In fact, um, many people in the Western tradition will use, uh, use quotations from this book of the Bible in wedding ceremonies. I think my brother did. It's very sexual. <laughs> so apologies. Um, it's very, very sexual. 
Uh, so here's kind of an example. Um, this is from, I think it's like line 7-3 or something. Anyway, whatever. It's 7-3 in the King James Version. So this is the version from 1605. Uh, that's a long time ago. That's when they tried to kind of clean things up. They didn't want to be overtly sexual. But here's the line uh, in the King James Version. This is a version Shakespeare would have read. Thy navel is like a round goblet, which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. So this is the husband's speaker. Thy navel, navel is a round goblet, which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly. So he's um, interested in her belly. You know, navel is like your belly button. Your belly is like a heap of white lilies. Uh, lots of interesting things here. Like how is a belly like a heap of white of wheat set with light white lilies or something? Set about with lilies. That's kind of strange, but perhaps her belly is really like, lilies are usually like white or at least beautiful and delicate and stuff. So maybe her belly is like beautiful and delicate and maybe the color of wheat um, okay, <laughs> a heap of wheat. Another thing that's interesting is, um, we'll talk about this in the next slide, but women in this tradition are often compared to agriculture. So if a woman's belly is like wheat, um, it can be harvested, it can be planted, you know, and planted and then harvested. Um, there's a kind of a connection to agriculture because uh, the female body especially is um, generative. It can reproduce like, um, you know, like, like the earth can. Uh, this is the very sexual part. Thy navel is like a round goblet which wanteth not liquor. So it seems like he's saying her belly button is like a wine glass with liquor in it. So he's like drinking from her belly button, which is kind of strange. But if we look at the um, the translation from Hebrew, it's much more explicit what's going on here. Um, you probably might have even thought about this. It's like, how can you how can your navel have liquid in it? It's kind of strange. But the translation from Hebrew, which for your information was, um, this was very controversial when it came out. People were kind of freaked out by how sexual this is. But it it seems like navel is probably something more like vulva. Um, so the female form um, is th this is, is referenced in a in a metaphor for oral sex. So your vulva your vulva is a bowl of the crescent, but it not lack mixed wine. Your stomach is a heap of wheat bordered with lilies. Um, so. You know, the, the husband figure is, like, celebrating this woman's, um, you know, her sexuality and, you know, drinking from it. You know, it's a bowl that's got mixed wine in there. And he's into it. So, um, very, very sexual. We'll talk more about maybe why. <laughs> okay, so the speaker in the audience in Song of Songs, I put plural too, because there's many, there's several speakers and there's maybe several audiences as, as well. Okay, so in these lines, this is the husband speaking. Um, note, as I read this, that there's a lot of imagery connecting the female body to agriculture and growing things. Um, okay, so the husband is speaking to the wife figure here. Behold, you are beautiful, my darling. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Behind your braids, your hair is like a flock of goats that flow down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ones who come up from the washing, all of whom are twinned, and none of them bereaved. Like a thread of scarlet are your lips, and your mouth is lovely. Like a slice of pomegranate is your cheek behind your braids, like the Tower of David is your neck, built to the heights. A thousand shields hang upon it all the weapons of the heroes. Um, your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a doe, grazing among the lilies. Until the day wind blows and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hills of frankincense. All of you is beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. So there's one section I want to keep going to, but just note, like, I mean, it's kind of strange to say that your hair is like a flock of goats and everything, but, um, you know, I mean, it's like she's like a living, breathing, like, nature scene, you know? Her hair is, like, beautiful and it's flowing you know, like down a mountain, her teeth and stuff, you know. This one's interesting. Um, You know, anytime in the West in poetry when a girl usually is being compared to fruit, a slice of pomegranate is your cheek. Um, You know, sometimes it's like your 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 breasts are like berries or something like that, or your lips are like cherries. It's, um, it's interesting. <laughs> like, why? Why compare features of a female to fruit? Um... Visually, in your mind, you're probably thinking, like, what do you do with pomegranate? You eat it, you know. 
it's kind of like, I want to eat you. <laughs> um, I want to, you know, I want to kiss your lips it becomes like your, your lips are like cherries. I want to put them in my mouth, you know, that kind of thing. Um, also note that, um, at least with fruit, uh, you know, fruit is something that is fresh and ripe and then it goes bad. And so there's always in these kind of images of fruit with women, there's a sense that the, the woman is young and, and, um, you know, like fertile, this sort of, sort of stuff. Um, you know, note that her breasts are like two fawns. These are baby, baby deer. Um, so yeah, there's just kind of like the sense of like youthfulness and like growing things. Um, yeah, springtime, you know, this sort of stuff, like young youth, all this stuff. So it might kind of creep you out a little bit, but like, you know, whatever. This is the Western tradi tradition. And so um, what's kind of interesting too is that her neck is like the Tower of David. So this very tall tower um, and it's got a thousand shields upon it. And weapons of the heroes so like I guess she's wearing a necklace <laughs> but um, her neck is being kind of like compared to this sort of like um, military stronghold and um, he mentions um, frankincense, frankincense and myrrh these are um, these are like uh, spices that smell really good so the, the girl smells great all of you is beautiful my darling there's no blemish in you lovely so you know, he's really into her okay then he continues this is a moment I want to talk about because it's kind of strange. He goes, A locked garden is my sister, my bride. A locked fountain, a sealed spring. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with fruit of choice fruits, henna with nard. So this, especially this image here. A locked garden is my sister, my bride. A locked fountain is a sealed spring. Of course, this is kind of incestuous. Um, <clears throat> just think of uh, the fact that the Jews would intermarry amongst other Jewish people. And so, in a sense, she is her his sister, probably not literal sister, you know, probably not, but, um, you know, it, she's his sister in terms of uh, their heritage and his bride. He calls her a locked garden, a locked fountain, a sealed spring. So this kind of harkens back to the last slide where um, her vulva was this, like, thing that he could drink from. There's a locked garden inside of her, I guess, a locked garden and a locked fountain. Let's talk a little bit more about what this means. <laughs> a sealed spring. <coughs> Enclosed gardens. Um, often in the West, this, this image comes from a medieval manuscript that references this tradition, but often in the West, um, women's bodies were being often compared to enclosed gardens. So a lovely garden that has a wall around it. Often these have like a spring inside of them too. I don't think I see one in this image, but anyway, you might ask yourself, like, why is a woman's body being compared to a locked garden? Um, I will tell you. So <laughs> one reason is um, it kind of goes back to the Garden of Eden. Remember in the Eden story, um, there's this garden. Adam and Eve have free reign of it. They can eat anything they want. However, something bad is able to infiltrate the garden. It's the serpent, and he um, tells them to eat from that they can eat from the uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They do, and then they sin, and then they're expelled from the garden. So something sinister enters the garden. Either it's the serpent himself, or maybe it's the thought of sin or the thought of knowledge. And Adam and Eve, you know, pursue that, those thoughts and actions, and then they're barred from the garden. So after Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden of Eden, um, the Song of Songs posits that, um, that humans can retain a sense of paradise, but with each other, like through marriage. So Adam and Eve, they fall out of favor with God in Eden, and so then it becomes harder to connect with God after the fall. Um, a lot of the stories in Genesis are about this, how difficult it is to connect with God. Like you might think of Cain and Abel's story or um, the Tower of Babylon story. Um, the Song of Songs, this lyrical dialogue between husband and wife, it suggests that the husband and wife figure in their relationship to each other, they can approximate the Garden of Eden again. But an important part is that they need to have that garden locked. This is a symbol as you might suspect, of um, female chastity. So particularly since it was Eve who sinned first, um, she's the one who was first infiltrated by the serpent and sin, um, Eve especially needs to be locked. You gotta keep the lady enclosed. 
So um, a locked garden, a sealed fountain is kind of a symbol of virginity. So my sister, my bride, is this locked garden, this, this virgin. Uh, meant only for the husband. Okay, <laughs> so this might, um, of course, this is like very patriarchal thinking and everything. Um, there's actually, a, what was that woman's name? Anyway, never mind. If you, yeah, we well, can talk more about this in class if you'd like. Okay, so as the poem continues, um, there's some moments here where uh, the bride herself gets to speak as well. So I, before, before now, I was only quoting from the husband's lyrics, but the wife also speaks too. Um, she's being presented as kind of like looking for her husband figure, her bridegroom. She's kind of like lost and she doesn't know where he is. Um, so here's a moment where she says, um, she's speaking to uh, this group of women, the daughters of Jerusalem. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, what will you tell him? That I am sick with love? Um, so she's looking for her bridegroom. Eventually she finds him and they love each other, etc. But um, what's interesting in terms of the the audience of the poem, when she says, I adjure, adjure you, daughters of Jerusalem, she's kind of speaking out of the poem towards us, the readers. And she calls us the daughters of Jerusalem. So she's kind of like in, assuming that we're all Hebrew like her. We're all daughters of Jerusalem, which is kind of cool. Um, the poem turns outward to the second person, us readers. Okay. Because of this, because we're turned outward, because we as readers are being incorporated into the, um, the group of Hebrews, the daughters of Jerusalem, uh, this has kind of influenced some allegorical readings of the poem. So same definition of allegory, there's like a hidden meaning here. Uh, and here's kind of the hidden meaning. So allegorically, the bride, so the one who's looking for her husband, the bride corresponds to the people of Jerusalem. The husband corresponds to God, is, is the sense that people take. And then in the Christian tradition, when they inherit this, this tradition, they say that the bride is the church of uh, Christianity, the congregation of Christians, and then the husband is Christ. So um, this is kind of interesting. It kind of doesn't make a ton of sense, literally, but this, this might help here. So I'm going to read this part aloud. So here I'm back to um, the husband figure. He's again describing the wife's body, nard and saffron, some sweet smelling things, nard and saffron, cane and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all heads of spices, a spring of the gardens, a well of living water and streams from Lebanon. Awake north wind and come south wind, blow upon my garden. May its spices stream, may my beloved come to his garden. May he eat of the fruits of its choice fruits. Oh, okay. This is interesting. So this is the husband. The italics is the wife. And then the husband comes back. So I'm going to start reading it again. So I'll do voices. So when I'm the husband, I'll like, I'll do lower voice. And then when I'm the wife, I'll do a higher voice. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So nard and saffron, cane and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all heads of spices, a spring of the gardens, a well of living water and streams from Lebanon. Awake north wind and come south wind blow upon my garden. May its spices stream, may my beloved come to his garden, and may he eat of the fruit of its choice fruits. I have come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I have plucked my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Okay, very interesting. So on one level, it's a dialogue between a husband and wife. He's very interested in how sweet-smelling she is. Um, he wants the winds to blow on the garden, maybe to pollinate her, I guess. She's into it too. She's like, yes, yes, come, beloved, come to his, your garden, you know, husband. Eat of the fruits of his choice. She wants to be eaten, you know. Very exciting. This seems kind of sexy, you know. And then he goes, yes, I've come to my garden. I've plucked the myrrh, etc. I have drunk my wine with the milk. Then he goes, eat, friends, drink, being drunk with love. This is a very strange... Part. If this is a dialogue between husband and wife, why is the husband inviting his friends to come <laughs> and eat from his garden, which is his wife? This usually strikes people as very strange. Like, is he pol like polygamous? Does he want, you know, to have like some sort of orgy or something? Does he want to share his wife with everyone else? I thought she was a locked garden, you know? 
I thought she was a virgin, meant only for him. So I put like a uh-oh, uh-oh face. So this is why people interpret this allegorically, because literally this seems very pro-sexual uh, mixing. <laughs> it seems pro, um, like, kind of like unrestrained sexuality. Come, eat friends, drink, be drunk with love. Eat from my garden, eat from my wife. So on a superficial level, the husband's calling for his friends to eat and drink from his garden slash bride. Allegorically, though, if we interpret this allegorically with the husband being God and the wife being um, the people of Israel or the church for Christians, this image in line, they're interpreted as God's bountiful love for his people. So like God is telling his friends to eat and drink and be drunk with love because um, the garden isn't, it's, it's on one level, it's the wife, but on another level, it's like, it's all of Jerusalem. It's like all of the, the people of God, if that makes sense. So this might not, you know, totally make sense to you. So let me know if you have questions about this. It's quite odd. But um, one, one thing to think about is um, this poem is so sexual that early people probably wanted to downplay some of the sexuality of it. You know, this is a, a poem that's pro-oral sex. It's pro-like polygamy, it seems, even here. And so one way to kind of downplay the sexuality of it is to say that sexuality is actually just a metaphor for God's love. Like we can only really understand God's love through these sexual terms. And so God's love is bountiful and it is given to everyone among his people. And so it's kind of like a husband with a wife figure that he invites everyone to enjoy, if that makes sense. Okay, so Stepping back a little bit, I'll have this a uh, discussion question here. What does the lyric mode allow that epic? Um, oh, what does the lyric mode allow that epic does not allow? So compare these poems to epics that you've read so far: the Epic of Gilgamesh and or the Iliad. Um, you might kind of spend some time thinking about that. Like, why do you think this tradition exists? Like, what is something that Epic of Gilgamesh can't really get at that these poems do? Or like, what can Sappho get at that? Um, Homer maybe can't. Um, and then I wanted to kind of like put some of the things I've said here together with some of the other ways we've seen sex and love functioning in creation myths. Um, just to remind you that like in the Greek tradition, Eros is a foundational god. You know, the original gods, Chaos, Gaia, Tartaros, and Eros. So Eros meaning sexual desire, erotics. Um, so this is such an important thing. Like, so in the Greek tradition, at least it's it's not only an emotion, but it's a god. Kind of interesting. And then to remind you again of um, Shamhat. So in the Epic of Gilgamesh, she w this was actually Ishtar dressed as um, a temple priestess, but Shamhat is a temple priestess in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And um, her job is to, um, to allow people to have sex with her as a way of accessing God. So sexuality in these two Western traditions are so linked to the idea of God and the divine as to be completely connected in, in the body of a female here and then in the sort of like original God figure of um, creation. So love and sex, um, this is something you might ask yourself about all these traditions that we've talked about, like in some of them, they seem to suggest that human love and sexuality should be suppressed or denied, you know, because it, it, it perverts or dilutes from your true spiritual nature. We might see a little bit of this happening in the cowherd and weaver girl myth, like when the two stars um, are in love, they're kind of thinking too much about the physical world and not enough about their spiritual world. But on, on the other hand, in some traditions, love and sex are so connected that they help us get closer to, to the divine. And so um, I'll ask you to think about this in a question as well. Okay, that's it for today.